kong cinta tersenti wei zi fa wei zi yi che zhong shen qing zhuang miao fa lun jiao dao wo men ru he liao shen to si li ku de le su zhen wu shen Will the Sangha with great virtue out of compassion for the sake of this assembly and all living beings please turn the wonderful Dharma will to teach us how to leave suffering and attain bliss and end birth and death and quickly realize non-birth Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa. Homage to the blessed, noble and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto sucheto ye alahati san miao san puto che. Wu shang shen shen wei miao fa, bai chen wan jie nan sao yi. Wo jin jian wen de shou chu, yan jie ru lai zhen shi yi. Supreme and wondrous dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in a billion eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently, when we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Rebel Master and all good knowing advisors, welcome back. This is uh, class number 79 in our exploration of the Dharma using the uh, Sutra of Medicine Master Buddha as our foundation or as a guide. Um, let's recite Medicine Master Buddha's name seven times. Namo quelling disasters, lending life, Medicine Master. Buddha Namo, 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 quelling disasters, lending life, medicine master. Buddha, medicine master, <coughs> does come one, medicine master, does come one, medicine master, does come one, medicine master, does come one. Okay, let me get to these slides. Slide show. In the meantime, does anyone have any questions? I always ask, but I don't usually get a response. You can type it in the chat box if you're feeling shy to speak up. All right, let's get on with today's uh, <coughs> slides. So where we are, we are still uh, on the heaven of the four great kings. And that's num heaven. If you look at the screen from number one, all the way up to 31 of the different realms in existence, uh, in samsara existence, you see 
uh, it will be number six. Okay, so let's continue with um, uh, from from last week. So this is on your screen right now. This is what we talked about last week. We went through what is known as the Chatur, Chatu Maharaja uh, Sutra or Sutta, where he explains how um, on certain days uh, the inhabitants of the four great inhabitants of the the heaven of the four great kings they come down and they record down the deeds of human beings and they get the news from the local spirits that live in your area okay and on the 15th day itself uh, who else but the four great kings themselves they come down to earth uh, to record the deeds for yourself they record it on a golden tablet and then they go report to lord chakra and the inhabitants of the heaven of the 33 which is the heaven above the heaven of the four great kings uh, to let them to keep them up with news on how human beings are behaving okay so there is a sutra called the adipateya sutta okay let me show you the sutta it's called the three governing principles and um, this sutta is used the buddha used this sutta to teach the monks how to practice, how we should, um, how you say, uh, exhort ourselves or the perspective that we should use on why we should not neglect our practice. Okay, so this sutra is called the Adipateya Sutta. Uh, it's very related to how we ended last week's class or lecture about uh, our, the deeds of human beings being recorded down. So the Buddha starts off by saying there are three governing principles and this is just an excerpt it's not the entire sutra and the buddha says what which three are known as governing principles so the buddha says the first is the self the self as a governing principle and then the second is the cosmos or the universe or the world as a governing principle and the third is the dharma as a governing principle okay so what does that mean okay Buddha explains, he says, what is the self as a governing principle? Buddha says there is the case where a monk, having gone to a wilderness, to the foot of a tree, or to an empty dwelling, reflects on this. It is not for the sake of ropes that have gone forth from the home life into homelessness. It is not for the sake of almshood, for the sake of lodgings, or for the sake of this or that state of future becoming, for example, being wanting to be reborn in the heavens uh, that falls into this category it says it's not for that they have gone forth from the home life into homelessness oh sorry there's a typo there ignore uh, whatever's after that that um, full stop so what does this mean the buddha says well th the this is the lifestyle of a monk a monk doesn't have any possessions apart from the robes that the monk wears and the arms bowl and um going out for alms food in order for lay people to generate blessings for them for themselves and uh, sometimes they have a lodging but usually in the forest style they live under a tree okay so the buddha says that given this limited possessions and uh, limited li lifestyle i guess uh, for a monk that's not why you leave home so you don't leave home because of wanting beautiful robes, okay? You don't leave home because you want to uh, get delicious uh, um, uh, alms food, you, okay? And the third one is, uh, you. sorry, not the third one. Uh, yes, the third one is for this, you don't leave home so that you can live in a very comfortable place. And finally, number four is that you don't leave home to chase after future rebirths um, uh, because the, the whole point of living home is to end but the cycle of birth and death okay so the buddha says that he starts off by explaining this as the governing principle this is the right perspective that a, that a monk or a practitioner is not necessarily not ne excuse me not necessarily restricted to a monk but for anyone who wishes to end the cycle of samsara, all right?
But here we have monks because that's who the Buddha is speaking to. That's his audience. Okay. So what else the Buddha says? He says, simply that I am beset by birth, aging, and death, by sorrows, lamentations, pains, distresses, and despairs, beset by stress, overcome with stress, and I hope perhaps the end of this entire mess of suffering and stress might be known. Okay, so this is the perspective of a left home person. A left home person sees the realities of life, which is that there's always potential um, for uh, suffering, for afflictions, for pain, for distress, and that uh, birth, aging, and death is something that you cannot escape from. So because they have seen the reality of uh, existence for what it is, it says, perhaps the end of this entire mass of suffering and stress might be known. So you want to find an end to it. Okay, what else does the Buddha say? It says, now if I were to seek the same sort of sens sensual pleasures that I abandoned in going forth from home into homelessness, or a worse sort, that would not be fitting for me. So it is the... Mm, how do I say? It is precisely the sensual pleasures of a householder's life that has the potential to bind one to a samsaric existence. So in order to escape from that, you leave home and you leave all the sensual pleasures behind. So a monk should always have this perspective of, this is why I have left home. So I shouldn't revert back to the comforts um, and activities of a, a, a householder. All right. So Shufu says that to endure suffering is to end suffering. So this is what it means. It means that when you leave home or when you put set your mind on the path um, of ending birth and death, you whatever suffering comes your way, you just endure it. Because for regular people, what happens is whenever there's, a, there's any slight suffering or affliction, we tend to run away. We tend to um, move away from discomfort and seek neutrality or seek comfort instead. So it becomes a habit and it becomes so ingrained in us that we don't even realize what we do. And one way to be aware of it is uh, to observe ourselves when we, for example, like all of us right now, uh, some of us are sitting and listening and we move. The moment we find a discomfort coming in in our legs or in our lower backs or in our shoulders, we move. Um, and most of the time we don't, we, we might be aware of it, but we don't think of it. It's automatic and we move because we want to feel comfortable. So when Shufu says to endure suffering is to end suffering for a for someone who's intent on practice, for example, when you're sitting in meditation and discomfort sets in, you deal with it. Not deal with it in terms of moving and and adjusting yourself, but you deal with the thoughts of pain and you figure out what is going on, what's behind these feelings and emotions and, and thoughts of pain and what false thoughts is it leading to, and you use that to understand the mind. So that's one way of, of looking at to endure suffering is to end suffering. It does not mean that you go look for suffering. Okay, during the Buddha's time, there were people who, uh, they stand on one leg, um, they uh, slap on a bit of nails. Uh, the, the Buddha himself as a prince, while searching for to end birth and death, he starved himself to the point of near death. Uh, and he realized that's not the way. So to endure suffering is to end suffering does not mean you seek suffering, but when you encounter suffering, you uh, you see it as the Dharma and you it's a, how you say, a moment for understanding more about yourself rather than the hab habitual uh, tendency to seek comfort instead. Okay, so the Buddha has explained this is what a man, a, a, a left home person should be thinking. Okay, and then the Buddha further says, he says, so he reflects on this. My persistence will be aroused and not lax. My mindfulness established and not confused. My body calm and not aroused. My mind centered and unified. So there's both 
body and mind uh, in, 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 for, in terms of the practice. So having made himself his governing principle, he abandons what is unskillful, develops what is skillful, abandons what is blameworthy, develops what is unblameworthy, and looks after himself in a pure way. This is called the self as a governing principle. Okay, so the Buddha explains this is what it means. So you use yourself. You use your understanding about the realities of life, about impermanence and suffering, and you that becomes one of your motivational motivations to practice, to end birth and death. And that's how you pay attention to your body and mind. Um, in the last paragraph, he abandons what is unskillful, develops what is skillful. That is, in other words, you can you can say that uh, that's called purifying uh, the mind. As in, you catch unwholesome thoughts and you deal with it. And if there are wholesome thoughts, you develop it further. All right. Okay, so that's the self as a governing principle. Okay, let's move on to the cosmos as a governing principle. So what is the cosmos as a governing principle, the Buddha asks. And then the Buddha answers, it says, there is a case where a monk, having gone to a wilderness, and then this formula repeats itself. The formula of where the Buddha says you, the monk goes to the foot of a tree, to an empty dwelling, and he reflects it is not for the sake of ropes or alms food or lodging or this or that that I've gone home. Okay, so that's why you have the three dots, the, I think it's called the ellipsis, um, and we don't need to repeat all of that. So now he says, now if I, uh, meaning the monk, have gone forth with the thing, thoughts of sensuality, thoughts of ill will, or thoughts of harmfulness, great is the community of this cosmos. Okay, what is this cosmos? It says, and in the great community of this cosmos, there are Brahmans and contemplatives endowed with psychic power, clairvoyant, skilled in reading the minds of others. They can see even from afar. Even up close, they are invisible. Invisible means you can't see them. With their awareness, they know the minds of others. They will know this of me. Look, my friends, at this clansman, who though he has in good faith gone forth from the home life into homelessness, remains overcome with evil, unskillful mental qualities. So the first part of the cosmos as a governing principle is being aware that there are many people in this world who you can't see because they have psychic powers, but they can read your mind. So for someone who has taken the step to leave home, to make that um promise to themselves to hold the precepts and all that. Someone like that should be aware that even your thoughts are not hidden from other people. Okay, so you should feel a sense of shame. Okay, so this is the first section of the cosmos as a governing principle. What's the second section? He says, there are also devas endowed with psychic power, clairvoyant, skill in reading the minds of others. They can see from afar, up close, and you up close you can't see them. Again, the formula repeats itself. It says, they will know this of me. Look, my friends, at this clansman. Clansman meaning um, you join the clan of, of monks. So clansman, who though he has in faith, good faith gone, from, gone forth from the home life into homelessness, remains overcome with evil and skillful mental qualities. So not just other practitioners. There might be very skilled monks in this world not just them or lay people, but there are also um, gods or devas, and this includes the um, the local spirits in, in, in your area who knows what you think. They can read your mind. Okay. So having known this, the monk then reflects, he says, my persistence will be aroused and not lax. My mindfulness established and not confused, and my body calm and not aroused, my mind centered, and unified. So the Buddha says, having made the cosmos his governing principle, he abandons what is unskillful, develops what is skillful, abandons what is blameworthy, develops what is unblameworthy, and looks after himself in a pure way. This is called the cosmos as a governing principle. So first you make yourself as the governing principle. So that's your thoughts, your conscience, uh, in another, another way of putting it. And you 
be respons- you make yourself responsible for your own practice. The second one is you are aware that in this world, uh, <coughs> there are other beings who can read your mind. So you should remain true to yourself. You shouldn't put out an outward outward experience, uh, appearance, an outward appearance that might fool some people, but internally you do something else. Okay. And then the third one is the Dharma as a governing principle. So I won't be repeating um, the, the repeated parts. Basically, this section is about the Dharma that's taught by the Buddha. And the text says to be seen here and now, timeless, inviting all to come and see, pertinent to be seen by the wise for themselves. They are fellow practitioners of the uh, chess life who dwell knowing and seeing it. If I, having gone forth in this well-taught Dharma and Vinaya, were to remain lazy and heedless, that would not be fitting for me. Okay, and then it goes on to say, um, having made the Dharma his governing principle, he abandons, etc., etc. That means he practices well, and this is called the Dharma as a governing principle. So you have the self, you have the cosmos or other beings, that means your thoughts cannot remain hidden, okay? And then the third one is the teachings left by the Buddha. That once you investigate, and you, now that you know for yourself, uh, you should practice accordingly. So the Buddha concludes with a verse. He says, there is in the cosmos no secret place for one who has done an evil deed. Your own self knows, my good man, whether you are true or false. You underestimate the fine witness that is yourself you with evil in yourself that then you hide. The devas and tathagatas see the fool who goes about out of tune with the cosmos. Okay, next next slide. Thus, you should go about self-governed, mindful, governed by the com- cosmos, masterful, absorbed, ab- absorbed in dhyana, governed by the dharma, acting in line with the dharma. The sage who makes an effort in truth does not fall back. Whoever through striving, overpowering Mara, conquering the Ender, touches the stopping of birth, is such a knower of the cosmos, wise, a sage unfashioned with regard to all things. So this is one way uh, for a practitioner <clears throat> to um, motivate themselves um, and, and not be lax or lazy. Excuse me, let me drink some uh, some water. So the Buddha says, don't think you can hide. Um, not just from yourself. You can't fool yourself and you can't fool. And there are many people, the devas, that you cannot fool. Okay. So one of the things about moving on to the next subject, one of the things about the four kings of the heaven of the four great kings is that last week i mentioned uh, they play a role when the buddha was uh, conceived in his mother's womb and then when the buddha was born uh, they, they were all there so i found a uh, a section there's a text a shastra or a commentary called the great chronicle of the buddhas it's a very very uh text, I think it's about maybe 1,700 pages. It talks about, I think, maybe the seven or the ten Buddhas uh, this, uh, of the past. And then it outlines the whole, uh, whole, what do you call it? There's a word for it. Anyway, it outlines the whole progress of um, the Buddha when he was a Bodhisattva in the Tushita heaven. And then how he came down into his mother's womb, Lady Maya or Queen Maya, and then uh, he was born and then the, the, the whole life until he became the Buddha. So this part is about the Buddha's conception. Okay, so I'll just read it. It says, from the moment the Bodhisattva was conceived, the Bodhisattva here refers to the Buddha, the future uh, Buddha or Shakyamuni Buddha. The Chatu Maharajika Devas, who are these? That's the Sanskrit or Pali for the four great kings. Okay, so namely Vaishravana and the others who live in this universe 
entered the splendid chamber of Queen Sri Mahamaya, that's the Buddha's mother, and gave protection continuously day and night. Okay, let me explain the um, the part where it says, and others who live in this universe. So Vaishwarana is the king of the north, and others meaning the other three kings. And when they say who live in this universe, uh, it is because there are many, many heavens of the four kings. There are many, many worlds. Okay, there are, I don't remember how many there are, but in this uh, universe that Shakyamuni Buddha resides in, I think there's at least a thousand great world systems. And in this thousand great world systems, there are smaller, each great world system has smaller world systems. And each world system has a Mount Sumeru and each Mount, Sum Mount Sumeru is if you remember the the, the 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 graphic that I showed is that is the ice cream cone the inverted ice cream cone in yeah the ice cream cone and halfway up every ice cream cone on Mount Sumeru there is the heaven of the four great kings so Sachal had a question uh, in our whatsapp group he asked about he says the sun last week we we read about the sun deva and the moon deva who was from this heaven the heaven of the four great kings and his question was are there an existence of the sun and moon deva well the sutras have not i have not come across any reference that in every world system there's the identical sun and moon deva uh, so this is the closest and in another in a few more slides, we will see uh, the sutras mention about the different four great kings, the other four great kings from the different world systems. Okay, that's why in this passage it says, and um, who live in this universe. So this story is specific to the four great kings within this universe. Okay, <laughs> all right, it's a big world. Yeah, so okay, continuing, each was holding a sword to ward off ghosts and uh, uh, how do you pronounce that? Ogres? O-G-R-E-S? Ogres? And unsightly beasts and birds, which could be seen or heard by the Bodhisattva and his mother. I need some help. How do you pronounce this word? O-G-R-E-S? Anyone? Ogre, Fasi. Ogre. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so they were there uh, to protect uh, the, the Buddha's mother, uh, Queen Maya. All right. Then the text says, in this way, 40,000 Maharaja Devas residing in the 10,000 world systems. Okay, so there you go. Each system having four such deities guarded the entire space from the doors of the queen's splendid chamber up to the edges of the world system, driving away the ghosts, ogres, etc. Such protection was afforded not because of the fear that someone would harm the lives of the Bodhisattva and his mother, but okay before we move to the next uh, slide there you go Forty thousand maharaja devas so four great kings from ten thousand world systems you get forty thousand world system so each system having four such deities so there's four great kings in every world system and there are ten thousand world systems so in every single world system the four great kings did the same thing they came down to earth uh, to Jambu Vipa, the continent where we are on, uh, to protect the queen. Okay, and then it says, it's not because of the fear that someone would harm the lives of the Bodhisattva and the mother. So it's not because that they would, uh, um, there was any potential harm that they came to guard. So it says, even if 100,000 crores of Maras were to bring 100,000 crores of gigantic Mount Merus to threaten the lives of the Bodhisattva in his last existence and his mother, all the Maras as well as the mountains would surely be destroyed and the Bodhisattva and his mother would remain unharmed. So in other words, there is nothing that can harm uh, the future Buddha and, his, and the mother. So the protection was just to ward off evil sights and sounds which could possibly cause anxiety and fear to the queen. Another reason might be sheer veneration and devotion inspired by the Bodhisattva's glorious power. 
So basically, they do they they do it out of respect and reverence, and because they can, and because it's, uh, you know, the thing to do. Um, I I I guess if any one of us could do that, you know, uh, why not? It's such a great thing to do. Okay, then says the question may then arise, whether the Dewa kings who came and kept guard inside the royal chamber of the Bodhisattva's mother made themselves visible or not to her. So as you can see, the great chronicle of the Buddhas is a very uh, interesting uh, commentary. And then the, the, the person who wrote the commentary answered himself, said the answer is, they did not make themselves visible when she was bathing, dressing, eating and cleaning her body. They made themselves apparent when she entered her chamber of splendor and laid down on her excellent couch so in other words just like any other guards you know they guard you if your bodyguards they guard you when they should be guarding you and then when you need your space you know when to do whatever you need to do they know when to leave so same goes for the four great kings and then uh, the commentary goes on to say the sight of devas might tend to frighten ordinary people but it did not scare the chief queen at all by virtue of the Bodhisattva's glow and of her own. Seeing them was just like seeing familiar female and male palace guards. So that's how it was. Okay. Um, okay, now we move to the next stage, uh, which is the Buddha's birth. We are still reading from the text called the Great Chronicle of the Buddhas, um, but now it is when the Buddha was born. Okay. So, the four great Brahmas, uh, meaning the four great kings, uh, sorry, these are uh, not the four great kings. These are the four great Brahmas from a different heaven, from a higher heaven. The, I believe this should be the heaven of the, uh, the formless heavens. I won't explain what they are right now because we'll get to there eventually. So the four great Brahmas who were free from all sensual defilements first received the Bodhisattva with a golden net the moment he was born. Then they placed him before the mother and said, Great king, Queen, rejoice, a son of great power has been born to you. Next, the four great kings, okay, so now it's the four great kings from this heaven, received the Bodhisattva from the hands of the four Brahmas with a black antelope skin, which was regarded as an auspicious object. Again, from the hands of the four great kings, the human beings received the Bodhisattva with a piece of white cloth. So when the Buddha was born, um, he was first received by the four great Brahmas, who then passed the Buddha to the um, the the four kings of the heaven of the four great kings, who then passed them to the human beings surrounding the queen, who I guess by that time had passed the 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 prince to to the the, the queen. So this is the role of the four great kings at the Buddha's birth. Okay, so from here, we then go on to a different stage and it's a different text now about how the Buddha um, received his alms bowl. Again, from spoiler alert, it's from the four great kings. Okay, it is said that if you look at the Buddha's alms bowl, the bowl that the Buddha eats, receives his food and eats his food, uh, food from, you will see at the rim on top that there are three lines. Okay, why are there three lines? Okay, let's find out. All right. So this is from a sutra called the Lati, uh, sorry, Lali Tavistara Sutra. It's called the Play in Full. Uh, this sutra also outlines in great detail the Buddha coming down from the Tushita heaven to uh, into his mother's womb. Uh, there are a lot of extremely interesting details for example, it, it talks about how when the Buddha was in the womb, uh, in reality, the Buddha was actually in a, a, a great uh, what is a mansion, a great palace made of, of gold, I think. Yeah. So uh, that was the Buddha's uh, state. The Buddha was actually residing in a palace, although for regular humans, we see it as the... Um, Queen Maya's uh, abdomen and 
during that time, during the 10 months that the Buddha was in the womb, uh, the Buddha had many visitors um, that he would receive in the palace. And when the Buddha was born, the, the heaven of the 33, which is the next heaven we're going to explore after we finish with the heaven of the four great kings, Lord Chakra, which is the heaven, which is the king of that heaven or the leader of that heaven, took this palace and stored it in that heaven uh, as an object of, uh, of reverence. And I think every year they have a festival where they um, pay respects to, to the mansion. Uh, maybe I'll share that story when, when the right time comes. Uh, but I'm just telling you how interesting this sutra is. Okay, so coming back to this sutra and the story of the Buddha Buddha's arms bowl. It starts before, uh, let me see. The, okay, it starts when the Buddha, the prince became the Buddha already. And this was in the seventh week. So the text says during the seventh week, the dusk, task gone one, sat at the trunk of a Bodhi tree. During that time, two learned and clever merchant brothers from the north, Trapusa and Balika, were traveling back from the south. After having gained much profit, with a caravan of 500 fully loaded carts carrying many kinds of merchandise. They had two bullocks called Sujata and Kriti. These two bulls had no fear of being waylaid and thus they could be employed where no other bullocks would pass. Whenever there was a threat, they would stand as though fastened to stakes. They could not be goaded by a whip, but only by handfuls of lotus flowers or garlands or jasmine flowers. Okay, why is this? Uh, <laughs> why does he start like this? Okay, so during the seventh week, the Buddha was meditating under a tree. And to cut a long story short, there was two traders, with, um, very rich traders, uh, with a lot of goods that they were transporting. Think of this as uh, maybe like a convoy of trucks, a modern equivalent, uh, but think of maybe like 50 trucks instead, 50 containers. And uh, it was headed and their chariots were in the front, were pulled by these two bulls. Uh, every chariot had two bulls, um, but at the front, two very well-trained bulls, okay? Why are we talking about the bulls? Because when this caravan of merchants approached the Bodhi tree, a goddess who lived in their forest of milk trees enchanted all the carriages, thus rendering them motionless. All the parts of the carriages, such as the harness and the rest, tore and split, and the wheels of the carriages sunk into the ground up to the axles. Even with everyone making great effort, the carts would move no further. So the merchants thought, since even these two animals will not move, there certainly must be some threat up ahead. Thus, they dispatched scouts on horseback. When the scouts returned, they reported there is no threat whatsoever. So because the Buddha was medi meditating under, the, under a tree, there was a, um, a, a goddess, a tree goddess. So this would be an earth boomer, uh, a boomer, earth or boomer, uh, Devi or Goddess, which we have covered before, uh, she used her powers to stop the carriage so they couldn't move. Why? Well, you know, you can imagine how 50 carriages of uh, of chariots or carts pulled by oxen and how many men are following after them, how much noise would that make? So the Goddess didn't want the Buddha to be disturbed. So she made the whole uh, carriage line stop. And because the two bullocks in front could not, did not want to move or rather were stopped, the merchants thought that there was a threat. So they sent a scout to check to see if there was no threat, to, to see if there was a threat or not. So at this point, the goddess revealed her form and consoled the members of the caravan saying, do not fear. Okay. Now the two bullocks could lead the carts to where the dust come one or dust gone one was. When they arrived, they saw the Buddha blazing like the god of fire, well adorned with the 32 marks of a great being, shining with splendor like the sun just after dawn. Seeing him, the merchants were amazed and thought, is this Brahma who has come here? Or is it Chakra, lord of the gods? Or is it Vaishravana? Vaishravana is um, uh, one of the kings or the four great kings, or perhaps the sun or the moon. Or is it some mountain god or some river god? So they saw the Buddha meditating and 
they had never seen someone like him, so they didn't know who he was. The Buddha then revealed his saffron robes, and so the merchant said, This person in saffron colored robes is a renunciant, so he is no threat to us. So they realized that um, the Buddha was a monk. And seven monks just after became the Buddha, uh, the Buddha wasn't well known at all. So they had in fact developed devotion to him, meaning the merchants. And so they said among themselves, it must be meal time for this renunciant. What morsels do we have? So a few members of the caravan said there is honey, gruel, and stri stripped sugar cane. So they went to where the dust come one was seated, or dust gone one. I'm not used to the term uh, dust gone one that's used in this sutra. Uh, so they went to where the Buddha was seated, bowed their heads to his feet, circumambulate him three times and stood to one side. Then they requested the, the Buddha, please regard us with compassion and accept, accept these alms. So when they saw the Buddha, they were moved by the Buddha's radiance and countenance. And um, the, the first thing that came to their mind was, oh, it must be time to eat. Let's offer this person something to eat. So, uh, so this is the Buddha uh, uh, actually recounting his story to the monks. So the, the Buddha says, monks, the Buddha then wondered, meaning himself, it would not be appropriate for me to take this alms with my hands. What vessel did the previous perfect and complete awakened ones use to accept alms? So right then, the answer dawned on him. So as the Buddha asked the question, he knew the answer. So monks, knowing that it was time for the Buddha to eat, at that very moment, the four great kings appeared from the four directions, carrying four golden alms bowls. They offered them to the dust count, to offer them to the Buddha, saying to him, please regard us with compassion and accept these four golden alms bowls. So the moment, the Buddha thought about having an alms bowl. The four great kings appeared from all the four directions, each holding a golden bowl, which they offered to the Buddha. All right, let's find out what happens next. Thinking, however, that those bowls were not appropriate for a monk, the Buddha did not accept them. So the four kings came back with four alms bowls made of silver, four made of beryl, four made of quartz, four made of coral, four made of emerald and four made of every gem. They offered them to the dust come one, but he declined, thinking that these were all inappropriate for a monk. So isn't, isn't that wonderful? They offered the Buddha, they each offered the Buddha an alms bowl made of gold. And the Buddha said, oh no, this is not appropriate. It's too fancy for, uh, for a monk to use. It's not appropriate. Guess what they did? They came back with bowls made of every imaginable precious uh, material so that the Buddha could choose one that's suitable for him. You know, silver, beryl, quartz, coral, emerald, all, uh, every gem. Yeah, uh, how, uh, how you say, how thoughtful uh, of them. Okay, then the Buddha says, monks, thus the, the Buddha then wondered what kind of alms bowl the previous the previous, dusk, uh, the previous Buddhas had used to accept alms. He understood that it was alms bowl made of stone, and so that thought dawned in the Buddha's mind. Okay, so the Buddha then investigated and, and found out that every past Buddha used an alms bowl that was made of stone, not from any fancy precious material, but just uh, regular stone. Okay. Then the great king Vajrawana said to the other three great kings, friends, when the gods of the blue class gave us four stone arms bowl, bowls, we thought that they were for our use. But a god of the blue realm called Viro China told us the following, listen, these arms bowls are not to be used. Preserve them. They will become honored as sacred objects. A victorious one called Shakyamuni will appear, offer these arms bowls to him. So the king of the north, the great king Vashravana, then remembered, he said, oh, remember uh, uh, when we receive uh, a bowl each from the, the gods of the blue class. What are gods of the blue class? It doesn't really explain, but they, um, that, you know, in Hindu, um, that when the Hindus 
depict their gods. Uh, they have blue skin. Uh, so there are certain gods that have blue skin and that's a mark of purity of their radiance. So the four great kings, re uh, they remembered that they did receive four stone bowls, uh, stone arm bowls from a higher class of devas and they were told not to use them. They're not for you to use. They're for you to keep because in the future, someone named Shakyamuni will come and then you will offer this to him. So he then, the the, the uh, king of the north, Vashravana, then uh, said in words, he said, Friends, the time has now come to offer a vessel to Shakyamuni. Paying homage with the melodious sound of songs and symbols, we will offer the begging bowls or alms bowl. Begging is not the, the right word. Uh, it should be alms bowl. He is a vessel made of dharma and it as and is indestructible. While these vessels made of stone are destructible, he will be unable to accept another bowl. Let's go so, so that he can accept them. Thus, the four kings, together, together with their kingfolk, and retainers, that means their uh, entourage and uh, assembly, went to the dust cup, went to the Buddha, holding those alms bowls in their hands and carrying flowers, incense, perfumes, garlands, and onions, playing cymbals and gongs and singing songs. Having paid homage to the Buddha, they filled the alms bowls with divine flowers and offered them to the Buddha. Monks, the Buddha then thought, these four devoted great kings are giving me four stone arms bowls, but four are too many for me. Because the Buddha just needs one. He says, yet, if I were to accept only one, the other three would be upset. So I will take all four arms bowls and transform them into one. So this is why if you, it is said that if you look at the rim of the Buddha's uh, bowl, you have three lines. Okay, so what... This particular sutra did not uh, describe how it happened, but uh, I was told, and I was a novice monk, I remember this story that was told to me, and I do not have the source, so if anyone has the source, uh, yeah, please share it with me. It is said that the Buddha took the four bowls and placed it one on top of each other, and he just used his hands and he just pressed them into one. So four bowls uh, nestled in each other, and... Uh, that became the Buddha's arms bowl. Yeah, four in one. Okay, like you have three in one coffee, there's a four in one bowl. So the Buddha continues saying, monks, the Buddha then extended his right hand and spoke to the great king, Vashravana in verse, offer an arms bowl to the bliss gone one. You will become a vessel of the supreme vehicle. By offering an arms bowl to the likes of me, you will never be bereft of mindfulness and intelligence. Monks, the Buddha then accepted the alms bowl from the great king Vasharana regarding him with compassion. And then the Buddha then spoke Dharma. Uh, so the Buddha, uh, so how it goes is, the Buddha first received the alms bowl from the king of the north and then he gave him a verse. All right. So now the Buddha says the dust got, the, the Buddha then spoke in words to the great king Dratarashtra. This is the second king of the four great kings. He says, Whoever gives an alms bowl to the dust come one will, will never be bereft of mindfulness and insight and will spend his time happily at ease until awakening to the state of cool repose. Then he accepted the alms bowl from, from this king. So imagine the, 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 the setting the Buddha is so, um, I'm not sure what word to use because, you know, there's, there's elements of compassion, um, but the, the basically the Buddha responds uh, really adequately in how you say, um, in Hokkien, there's a saying in the Chinese dialect, Hokkien, uh, mm -hmm. the Buddha knows how to behave or how to repeat, uh, the Buddha knows, let me see, what's the equivalent English? Mm. The Buddha knows how to respond in every situation. So in this situation, it was very elegant, uh, you know. Uh, so the Buddha accepted the bowl from each of the four kings and, and, and gave them each 
uh, a personal uh, uh, worse as he accepted the bowl. Then the Buddha, from the third great king, Virudaka, the Buddha said, give a pristine alms bowl to the dust come one, pure in mind, and you, and you will swiftly become pure in mind, worthy of veneration in the world. And as the Buddha received the fourth alms bowl uh, from the king Viru Paksa, the, Buddha, the Buddha's words was, give with faultless intention and devotion a faultless vessel to the Buddha who is faultless in discipline and conduct and your merit of generosity will be faultless. So imagine getting a personal verse from the Buddha. And then when the, when the Buddha had accepted it, he transformed all four alms bowl into one through the power of his wish and then said this meaningful verse. Since in the previous existence I offered alms bowls, filling them with fruit and making them lovely, the four miraculous gods are now giving me these four well-formed alms bowls. So the Buddha attributed um, his current blessing of being able to receive alms bowl because in his past lives, he, he made offerings of alms bowls that were filled with fruit and decorated in such a way that they uh, says uh, and making them lovely. Yeah. Okay. So we are at more or less the end of our exploration of the heaven of the four kings. Do we have any questions or any remarks or anything to share from those who are joining us? Okay. Um, if not, or if there is, just tap into the chat box or unmute your mic. Um, right now, every day, I uh, am the proctor or the Waino for the meal offering, which means I have to go down a bit earlier. So that gave me the idea of beginning our class uh, earlier, either an hour earlier or half an hour earlier. Uh, I'm not sure what people think. Either you can tap into the chat box or I will ask this over our WhatsApp group and see what the res response will be like. Okay, I hope it won't be too much of trouble for people to join us earlier. Um, so we have a few minutes left and let me see, maybe I will share another story about the Buddha's bowl. Um, okay, uh, the, this is a very interesting story. So this is before the Buddha became the Buddha, all right, when he was, um, uh, this was the point where the Buddha had starved himself eating only one sesame seed a day. And then he realized that if he were to continue this practice any longer, uh, his body would give up and he would die without finding uh, a solution to end birth and death. So after he had made this de decision, uh, he went into the river to, to clean himself. And when he came out from the river, he wanted to sit down. So he was looking for a suitable place on the river bank to sit. So it is said that right then, a dragon girl who was living in the river uh, came to the earth's surface and offered the uh, the Buddha, or rather the Bodhisattva, he wasn't the Buddha yet, uh, a throne made of jewels to, to sit on. And I think this is when um, what we see as grass, uh, in reality, from the Buddha's point of view and from other beings' point of view, um, a precious throne. So the Buddha sat there and um, he, at this time, he had received the, uh, an offering of milk porridge made with honey from the village girl Sujata. So this is a famous story where the Buddha came out of the river and he received the milk porridge uh, that was cooked with honey. And what we what is not commonly shared with that story is that not just did Sujata, the girl, uh, made that offering of, of milk porridge, she served it to the Buddha with a bowl uh, made of gold, with a golden bowl. And uh, the Buddha said uh, he could not receive the bowl, but Sujata said it's part of the offering. So he accepted the bowl. And then as soon as he had finished uh, eating the, the milk porridge, he just threw the golden bowl into the water. 
Okay, so the Buddha um, did not keep the bowl for himself. So it is said that as soon as the bowl hit the water in, in the river because the Buddha was sitting next to the river, there was a Naga king called Sagara, a dragon king whose name was Sagara, and who was waiting and he had great devotion and respect for the Buddha. So as soon as the bowl hit the water, he quickly uh, uh, snatched the bowl up and said, oh, this is worthy of veneration. He was going to pay respects to the bowl, kind of like how we pay uh, respects to the Buddha Sharira, uh, just like that. So as soon as he had got the bowl, uh, he was not the only one who wanted the bowl. <laughs> At the same time, uh, Lord Chakra or Indra, and this is from the heaven of the 33, the heaven above, uh, this heaven of the four great kings. He transformed himself into a Garuda. So if you remember from previous classes, the Garuda is the giant bird that eats uh, dragons. So he transformed himself into a Garuda to try to steal the bowl from the dragon king. Yeah, but he couldn't match the dragon king. Uh, in other words, he, he was not able to take the dragon king uh, to take the bowl that the Buddha had used from the Dragon King. So he changed into his original form as, as Lord Chakra or Indra. And this time he was very polite and he requested the bowl very politely from the Dragon King. And the Dragon King then gave the bowl to him. Uh, so what Lord Chakra did was he took it to uh, the heaven of the 33 and uh, he started a festival, a religious festival called the procession of the bowl and apparently the, this festival is observed on the days of the astrological juncture i don't know what that means astrological juncture but when that happens uh, they in the heaven of the 33 they hold a festival called the procession of the bowl and it is said that to this day the gods in the heaven of the 33 hold an annual festival of the bowl Annual, I guess, is not our annual, but is uh, their annual, uh, meaning a very long time for in terms of human years, and um, yeah. So that's the story of uh, the uh, of a gold bowl that the that the prince that the Bodhisattva used before he became the Buddha. Yeah. Uh, okay, we have to end so that I can get down and prepare for the meal offering. No questions, anyone? Anything to share? Okay, let's dedicate merit. Okay, I'm going to invite everyone in joining me in putting our palms together. May every living being, our minds as one and radiant with light, share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity, may our minds awake to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave our grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of our endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. Okay, two, three bows to the Buddha. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. Half bow. Bowing respect to the Rabo Master. Second bow. Third bow.
half bar. Alright everyone, we'll see you next week and we will explore the next heaven up called the heaven of the 33. Thank you, Dhamma Master. Amitofo. Thank you.